Son, the Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. So um, I'll go to the, the presentation we had, and then we uh, we will go from there as we had done before. So the, the, the first two councils that we looked into, the Council of Nicaea, 325, and then we looked into the Council of Constantinople, where the two pieces of the creed were um, made. And uh, the next council in Ephesus is where what we have, we call it an introduction to the creed, was done. It's 431. And this uh, subject, I'm just trying to kind of link the things together. So it's actually one process. In this, in this council, the, the divinity of Christ was confirmed that the church believes in Christ as a, a divine person who's equal to the Father, not not less than the Father or an, of another nature. When this was done, the, the next uh, focus was on how can be a divine person and a human being in the same in the same place in the same uh, existence. And the uh, the answer that was given by Apollinarius, this guy said. Uh, he has to have the soul, the human soul, replaced by the divinity. And the church kind of also rejected this idea. And they said there had to be a union between the two. And uh, that, uh, that was not um, neither two persons nor a replacement, the, the replacement of the divinity to the soul of the human soul in Christ. So the next person comes in line and says, I have the solution for you. There were two persons. There were... Uh, a human person and a divine person in a, in a unity like marriage. And they were always together. And the, uh, the uh, divine person had to encourage the human person to sacrifice. The hero of that council and the hero of that time was Saint Cyril of Alexandria, who uh, he, he made it very clear that if Christ was not one person and uh, this, the salvation would have not happened it has to be divine and human at the same time without losing any of the characters of the human nor the characters of the divine. So uh, he made an example, and I think this is the simplest way to think about it, of iron and fire. He says when you heat up a, a piece of iron, a metal, and fire, it will retain both characters, the fire characters and the, and the iron characters. It will still be solid, and you can actually... Uh, uh, make an impact when you hit with it and it would burn at the same time so um, he, he thought about it as, as fire being uh, not a physical existence it's an energy but then the um, the metal as a physical existence although the two different natures and the different have different characteristics the uh, the, 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 the union of the two makes the two characteristics obvious but yet they are not separated, you cannot separate them from each other. So he is the one who coined the term Theotokos, and, and this is important. Theotokos is a Greek word, means uh, Theo means God, Tokos means mother, mother of God, mother of God. So mother of God is a term that the church insisted on from the beginning. And if you ask Saint Cyril, why did you say that Saint Mary is the mother of God? It say it has nothing to do with Saint Mary herself, but to confirm that the the baby that was born of her is is God is God the Son. So um, because Nestorius at the time that that person who said uh, that Jesus was two persons, he said the human was born first, and then the divine indwelt the human later. So he said he would reject the idea of worshiping the baby that was born of St. Mary. And he would criticize the wise men for going there and worshiping him. St. Cyril said they had all the right to worship him because he, was, since he was concept, concepted in the conception, he was God incarnate. So uh, that's why he called St. Mary the mother of God. Some people in, in the current times, they say, no, don't call her the mother of God. She is the mother of Jesus, okay? 
you can say that, that's fine. But if you reject the idea of he, she being the mother of God, and we don't mean the mother of God by our St. Cyril didn't mean that, that she is the source of the divinity. That's not, that's crazy to think. But what whoever she gave birth to is really and truly God. So that's what we mean. She's the birth giver. The birth giver of God means she gave birth to the only begotten son of God. So uh, when, when, um, when people ask, how do you understand this? So why there's no two, two egos or two eyes in Jesus? And the answer is very simple. There was never a formed human ego away from the incarnate word, the word that came from heaven and dwelt the, 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 the cell that formed the humanity of Christ from the beginning. So there was not a separation between the human and the divine. The, the human person grew up in perfect uni, union with the divine. And the divine was the, uh, if you want to say, the ego, the I in Jesus. That's why you have him in the St. John Gospel saying, I am the life, I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the resurrection and life. I am the light of the world. I am. So when this I, this I am, is the word. And the I of the human never developed away from that. It was in, in, in the I of the divine. That's how we understand it. So this went on, and this is going to be the beginning of problems. Like I told you, in this council, there was ranking of the churches in the Council of Constantinople. And people started, the, the patriarchs and all the church started to uh, kind of protest. They didn't like the idea of ranking churches. And they pushed Alexandria and Antioch way down in the list. Where before that, there were no ranking. Churches were all equal. When you come to Ephesus and the city of Alexandria, it began a big problem. After St. Cyril had um, died, the churches started to fight over who will be the, the, has the final word until we come to this council here. It's 451 AD. This council for us, the cops is the beginning of sorrows. They, um, they started to say that Jesus has, um, so let me just put this right so you really get it. There is a difference over language. The How you describe Jesus being of divine and human without separating him, without separating them. So the West and the Church of Rome and even Constantinople at the time said, we can say he is two natures in one person. Two natures in one person. At the time in this area, 451, Eutychus, who was a, 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 like a, a head of a monastery in Constantinople, said Jesus didn't have two natures. He only had one nature. That's the divine nature. And he put on a human shape. Very close to that, so that without going into details. So, of course, his patriarch said this is a heresy, and uh, he, uh, you know, got him uh, judged and uh, tried, and he, uh, he insisted that this is what he believes, and that's what he would teach. So the patriarch stopped him from practicing. He was a priest. So he went to Alexandria crying. When he went to Alexandria, he asked him, how, what did you say? He said, uh, um, he said something that's not really reality truth. So he said, uh, I said, uh, I believe in St. Cyril's formula, and he excommunicated me for that. The patriarch of Pope Discourus the, of Alexandria sided with him for some reason. He never, so Pope Discourus at the time in Alexandria never got uh, the truth. So uh, he did something wrong. What did he do, Discourus, our patriarch? He reinstated him back into his rank as a priest. And we totally agree this is a mistake. 
he should have not reinstated him back. He's from Constantinople. He should have left the Patriarch of Constantinople to deal with him. And if they needed to have a council, there would be a council of more than one church. That's the way it should be done. But Bob Discourse went on and uh, uninformed, reinstated Eutychus, that uh, heretical person, into his rank. When this happened and the Patriarch of Constantinople heard about it, he got angry and he called a council against Pope Dioscorus. So they brought Pope Dioscorus to a place called uh, Chalcedon, and that's again in Turkey in Asia Minor. And there they tried him. They had not even listened to him. The, he didn't even was admitted. He was not admitted to the council. And was, yeah, go ahead. How are because of uh, communication barriers from uh, today to then, how long was he accepted back or reinstated back before others had found out? Uh, the the Eutychus, the the priest. Yes, when he when he's I, like, oh, I he's wouldn't I wouldn't have the answer. Maybe I we can go if you have if you if you want to you know we can go to. Uh, it was just a yeah. curiosity. Just I curiosity. I will I would have I think it's a good idea to go and uh, let's let's go do that. Okay, so screen share. Okay. And do you mind if I ask another question while you? Yeah, go ahead. I love questions. Please do. Oh, so, um, yeah, I know you don't like lecturing twenty four seven, so I got you. Great. <laughs> Uh, so when he's back and he's reinstated and he's preaching, what happens to all of his uh, the people he's teaching, his congregation? Um, he was, and uh, so all these people had people following, definitely. Right. And uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, if it happens today, let me tell you what happens. It's the same thing that happened in the past. Uh, so you get somebody else from the mother church, from the uh, from either if, if it's a local person like a bishop or a priest, then the patriarch of that church will appoint somebody else to take care of the congregation and gently trying to teach the right, the right thing. But if it is happening to a big group under a patriarch, this will have to have the council actually the, in the council in those times, the, the exiled the patriarch from his place so that he would not continue teaching this. Because of the, you remember at the time there was uh, a, a Christian emperor, the, the, the Byzantine, or Constantine and the, the, his children after him mm -hmm. were in charge of, of those councils uh, politically wise, but not theologically, like we said. Today we do this. We, if we have some priest or somebody teaching something uh, wrong and the church and, and the, and the synod, the Holy Synod, th sees that they're teaching something against the faith of the church, they will uh, remove him from that place. He will be removed. What is, um, so because this has happened a few times throughout, what I'm understanding, I understand what happens to uh, the priest or whoever's preaching, but for the people who are following him, that has right. to be shocked. They will have to be, they will have to be um, instructed and told and explained to them why this happened. They cannot just take their, uh, their uh, shepherd without explaining to them why he was taken and uh, of course you're going to have opponents and you're going to have people who are very enthusiastic following them but then at the end people in the church in the in the traditional apostolic church they would listen to the 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 universal church the the bigger the bigger body of the church okay so this is not because it's i think it's different today when somebody doesn't like the teaching of a preacher what they do they go out and make a new church Right. That's totally different than what it used to be. So uh, the, the Council of Chalcedon uh, was the fourth ecumenical council, the ecumenical council of the Christian church convoked by Emperor Martian. The council operated in Chalcedon, Bithynia, modern, modern day Turkey, from 8 October to 1st November and was attended by 520 bishops. So their representative continues to present the largest and best documented early councils. The principal purpose of the council to reassert the doctrine of the Council of Ephesus against the heresy derived, that's Eutychus that I told you about, and Nestorius to Stu. Such heresies attempted to dis dismantle and separate Christ's divine nature from his humanity, and further to limit Christ as solely divine in nature, that's monophysitism. This is, this is important, I will tell you why in a second. Monophysitism is the one nature. So if you 
Christological term derived from uh, monos, alone, solitary, and thesis means a word that has many meaning, but it, this context means nature. It's defined as a doctrine that the, in the person of the incarnated word were, was only one nature, the divine nature. So this is basically what it is. Nestorian, the one from the Council of Ephesus, who said Jesus is two natures. The Monophysites would say Jesus is one nature. Uh, we all teach harmoniously. The same perfect in Godhead, the same perfect in manhood means he is perfectly God, perfectly man, truly God and truly man, the same of a reasonable soul and body. Homo osseus with the Father, that's the word we said that the Arians hated in Godhead, and the same homo osseus with us, and he's homo osseus with us in manhood, acknowledged in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. So this is important to understand that there is no confusion, no change, no division, no separation. No division for us is very important that there were not, not at any point. What does that mean? So uh, some people would say that's the Nestorian's way of teaching. They would say the divine did the miracles and the human thirsted, hungered, and uh, suffered and died. So here they attribute actions, certain actions, and life um, stages of Christ or life um, events. Uh, they attribute some of them to the divine, some of them to the human. So this is actually rejected by the church. It's not really something that, so the divine and the human in, in complete union went through all of it, through all of it. And if you want and interested, I can tell you why this is extremely important. And Saint, Saint Athanasius already had said it before. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I was teaching this in the seminary about why did Jesus have to be incarnated and to die and to rise, why? And we said it's very important to understand the, the the reasoning behind that. Otherwise, all this will make no sense. Or what we're discussing, it's all just uh, mental mental exercise. So they say um, Saint Peter in, the, in his first letter, I think, he said that why did Jesus have to suffer, but to bring us to God, to bring us closer to God. So this is the understanding of the church that by Jesus being incarnated, the gap between us humans and God is bridged. And we talked about this, I think you attended one of those. So that he, he had to be born because the first birth happened after the separation, happened after the sin. He had to be, to be, to be, to die because death didn't happen when we were with God, it happened outside, because that's how death is. It's, it's a separation from God, but he died um, in, uh, in the flesh, you say, he died in the flesh. So Jesus, by becoming incarnate and suffering and dying, he bridged the, those two items that separated us from God. And he died to also to cover this, this, the sins and its results that really separate us from God. So you have those two aspects, the natural separation and the moral separation. The moral separation is sin. When we are, uh, when we break the commandments, we are not like God. We're very far away from God. So Jesus had to cover that up. And the Jews understood from the Old Testament, you, um, you cover sin or you uh, me medicate sin, you, you, you treat sin with three things. One, punishment. Two, expiation. Three, exilement. So he said, uh, they said Jesus had to be exiled, had to be uh, punished, and had to be sacrificed. So from the two aspects, we know that by him coming and incarnating, becoming a man, he bridged the first part, and, and dying and rising, he bridged the second part. So we're actually having a full access to God through being one with Christ. We have to be one with him. That's the, that, that's the secret. So uh, that's why he had to be a human, a human being without division, without separation. If he was separated, then the humanity was not redeemed. If he had not taken our human body completely to be his forever, we could not be redeemed forever. That's very simple. So 
you, you might ask, or somebody might ask, will we go to heaven? Will see Jesus in his body? Of course you will. How long is he going to have that body? What happens when we are resurrected? Our faith is he's going to be like us in every single thing. If he is not, and if he's going to give it up, we will stop being redeemed. So this is extremely important that his manhood, his humanity is completely his, completely. As you look at your own body and say, this is my body. You look at your foot and you say, this is my foot. Wherever I go, it goes. Wherever I sleep, it sleeps. So this is extremely, extremely essential in our understanding of the Bible and our salvation. While this judgment marks significant turning point in the Christological debates, also generated heated disagreement between the council and the Oriental Orthodox. This is us. This is Oriental. This is um, uh, Armenian. That's Armenian Orthodox. Who are the Oriental Orthodox? Now we, we, we're, we're turning into a, an important piece here. So a group of Eastern Christian churches adhering to what we call Mayaphysite. This is important, not Monophysite. Mayaphysite. Christology, with a total of approximately 60 million members worldwide. The Oriental Orthodox churches are broadly part of the Trinitarian Nicene Christian tradition shared by today mainstream churches. Let me just go there and read it. Um, and represent one of its oldest branches. As some of the oldest religious institutions in the world, the Oriental Orthodox churches have played a prominent role and the history and culture of Armenia, Egypt, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Western Asia, and India. An Eastern Christian body of autocephalous churches, its bishops are equally by virtue of episcopal ordination, and its doctrines can be summarized in that the churches recognize the validity of only the first three economical councils. They, they reject Chalcedon. That's basically it. This is the church in Egypt. That's the cathedral in, in Cairo. That's uh, Armenia. Echmiadzin, the cathedral of Armenia. Um, might be this one is the Ethiopian. So here it is. Uh, Echmiadzin, Armenian Apostolic Cathedral, St. Mark Coptic Orthodox, uh, in the Mariam Eritrean. That's Eritrean Ethiopian Cathedral. This is Eritrea. And that's India. That's uh, Orthodox, Indian Orthodox, their sister church too. St. George Syriac Orthodox Cathedral, that's it. So uh, these are the churches. So if you count them, they will be alphabetically Armenian, Coptic, Eritrean, Ethiopian, Indian, and Syriac. So count them, maybe oh, it should be uh, uh, six, six churches or seven. Let's go again. So the first three churches from the Oriental group is um, Armenian, Armenian, Coptic, and Syrian. Those are the three. From the Coptic came the Eritrean and the Ethiopian. And from the um, the uh, Syriac came the Indian Orthodox. They all share the same uh, stand and the same faith. And uh, we will see what happened to this group in Chalcedon. So Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria, Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch, Armenian Apostolic Church, Malanka Orthodox Syrian Church, Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahito Church, Eritrean Orthodox Tawahito Church. They consider to be themselves to be the one holy Catholic and apostolic church founded by Jesus in the, his great commission. And that is, its bishops are the successors of Christ's apostles. Most member churches are part of the World Council churches. The three very different rites are practiced among the churches, the Western-influenced Armenian rite, the West Syriac rite, and the Alexandrian rite. So you have uh, three different rites. I want to talk about rights at one point. Uh, so what, uh, what is the right? Right is, is a cultural uh, response to the gospel. 
basically. The gospel is preached to a place and that place have music, have colors, have art. So they gather all the things that they have, the riches, as Isaiah spoke about it, the riches of the world. And they give it to the church and they make the church out of that, the music, the art, the culture, everything, the best they have. So uh, these are the five oriental churches. So what happened in Chalcedon? What happened in Chalcedon? Um, generated heated disagreements between the, between the council and the oriental orthodox church who did not agree with such conduct or proceedings. This disagreement would later in, inform the separation of the Oriental Orthodox churches from the rest of Christianity and lead to the council being regarded as Chalcedon the ominous or the ominous. Chalcedon the ominous means bad news. It's, it's really the, one of the, the worst news in the church history. Um, so when you go to the topic, the judgments issued at the Second Council of Ephesus, um, etc. So they, they had, um, they had uh, judged Dioscorus, the Patriarch of Alexandria, for uh, bringing back Eutychus to his place, confirming that he actually agrees with him on his teaching of monophysitism, that he, that Dioscorus, the Pope of Alexandria, had uh, uh, adopted the belief of Eutychus. So, um, but then at the end, when you read the minutes of the of the council, they didn't allow him even to speak for himself. And then he was judged for what you call it managerial errors. Managerial errors. So this is the controversy. About two years after Seal of Alexandria's death, I said this is the he was very respected, very respected theologian. People would listen to him from the east and the west. An aged monk from Constantinople named Eutychus began teaching a subtle variation on the traditional Christology in an attempt to stop what the, what the new what he saw as a new outbreak of Nestorianism. This is always extreme defense. When people goes to the other extreme to defend something, we're going to see this happening over and over again in the church. He claimed to be a faithful follower of Cyril's teaching, which was. He was from Constantinople, from uh, Turkey. But he, as, as many people in that time, read. Uh, Cyril was an avid writer, very pro prolific writer. And he, um, um, he, he, he loved Cyril very much. So Cyril had told that there is only one thesis, since it is the incarnation of God, the Word. So he's saying, you can say thesis as nature, but it, it doesn't have to, to mean a singularity. That's why we say mea thesis means united, united nature. Um, so, Cyril apparently thought that the Greek word thesis meant approximately what the Latin word person means. This is exactly it. So remember that at the time, the language has not yet developed the terminology of theology that we know today, that has been defined and, and known, was very vague, very vague. So um, Cyril used the word thesis to mean person. So it means, uh, while most Greek theologians would have interpreted that word means as nature, the energy and the imprudence with which Eutychus asserted his opinions led to his being misunderstood. Thus, many believe that Eutychus was advocating docetism. It's a, a sort of reversal of Arianism. So Arian, Arian says he's a human being. And uh, the, docetis, the docetics is like the Gnostics. They think the body is, is evil. So it has to be a spirit, not, not body. Where Arius had de denied the constant substantial divinity of Jesus means equal to the Father, Eutychus seemed to be denying that Jesus was fully man, human. Now we come to Pope Leo the Great, the Columbia, Leo the Great in the Catholic Church, wrote that Eutychus' error seemed to be more from a lack of skill than from malice. They give him an, uh, the, the excuse of, or the 
benefit of the doubt. Eutychus had been accused or accusing various personages of covert Nestorianism. Again, Nestorianism means that Jesus was two persons. In November 448, Flavian Bishop of Constantinople held the local senate regarding a point of discipline connected with the province of Sardis. At the end of the session of the Senate, one of those inculpated, Eusebius Bishop of Turilium, brought a counter charge of heresy against the Archimedrite. Eusebius demanded that Eutychus be removed from the office. Flavian preferred that he, the bishop, and the Archimedrite sort out their differences. That's Eusebius and Eutychus. But as his suggestion went unheeded, Eutychus was summoned to clarify his position regarding the nature of Christ. Eventually, Eutychus reluctantly appeared, but his position was considered to be theologically unsophisticated, and the Senate, finding his answers unresponsive, condemned and exiled him. Flavian sent a full account to the Pope of Rome at the time, Leo, although it had been accidentally delayed. Leo wrote a compendious explanation of the whole doctrine involved and sent it to Flavian as a formal and authoritative decision of Quish. Eutychus appealed against the decision, labeling Flav Flavian an historian, and received the support of Dioscorus. Here we go. Um, so this is like an innate rivalry between the seas of Alexandria and Constantinople. So whose word is going to be stronger? This is the beginning of the, the problems. Dioscorus, imitating his predecessors, and assuming a primacy over Constantinople, held his own synod, which annulled the sentence of Flavian and absolved Eutychus. That's the second, they called second of Ephesus. They call that a synod or the council, councils of robbers, council of robbers, meaning they are trying to steal the place of Constantinople. Um, so this, through the influence of the court official, um, the competing claims between the patriarchs of Constantinople and Alexandria led Emperor Theodosius II to call a council, which was held in Ephesus, with Dioscorus presiding. So that actually was done by the by the by the emperor. Pope Leo sent four legates to present him and expressed his regret that the shortness of the notice must prevent the presence of any other bishop of the West. He provided his legate, one of whom died en route, with a letter addressed to Flavian explaining Rome's position on the controversy. In Leo's letter, now known as Leo's Tomb, this was, this was brought to Egypt after the exile of Dioscorus, and the persecution of the Copts started then by this one. I've heard about this tomb when I was a child, hearing about it in our history of the church. Confessed that Christ had two natures, very clear, and was not of, of or from two natures. That's the stand of Alexandria. We say one of, is, uh, Leo says one in two natures. The second council of Ephesus began its sessions. The acts of the first session of this synod were read at the council of Chalcedon and are thus preserved. The remains of the acts, um, so I'm going to just go... This is the same thing that St. Pope Discourse said. They, say they, they kept Dioscorus' words, but excommunicated him and exiled him. don't know what's happening here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, here is the important piece. So the second council of Ephesus began its first session. The acts of the first session of the Senate were read at the council of Chalcedon and are thus preserved through Chalcedon. The remainder of the acts are known through a Syriac translation by a mere, ah, oh, hate this. Uh, 
I'm sorry. I think I think I missed your second question, uh, Levi. Yep, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, what, what was your second question? I, I remember now you had a second question and I missed it. No, no, no. You were, you were telling me uh, the first question was about the priest, but the second question was about what happens to their following or the congregation. Oh, that's the second one. Sure. Because, uh, yeah, the first part was over the timeline just because it, someone would have had to have gone back and said, hey, this guy is still preaching the same thing. So either they were checking in on him or I was just curious how he got caught. Because I think I um, I believe that he the, in those times people are very keen on learning and teaching. The teaching was very important, and they were listening with all intent. So if somebody would listen and hear something a little bit unusual, they would report it immediately. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's not like today. There's lots of uh, people talking, and there's YouTube's and there's recordings and. You know, you know, it's 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 there's no end to the noise today. But then in those times you used to go, people used to go physically to the church to listen to the preacher. <laughs> okay. Um, so they they did the Council of Ephesus and they they uh, moved to and the Council of Ephesus was uh, ordered by the Emperor Theodosius II. Um, throughout the proceedings, Hillary, one of the Papal legates repeatedly called the readings of Leotom, but was ignored. The Eastern Orthodox Church has very different accounts of the Second Council of Ephesus. Popius Chorus requested the differing reading, deferring the reading of Leotom, as it was not seen as necessary to start with and could be read later. This was seen as a rebuke to representatives from the Church of Rome not reading the tome from the start. So the people from Rome wanted the, the Pope to start the meeting by uh, it's almost like giving them the creed, that Rome will make the creed. Dioscorus said, no, Rome does not have authority to make a creed for us. The council have to find that as a, as a group, not by a single person dictating to us. And you see that how is that is going to be very problematic, of course. Dioscorus then moved to this to post Flavian of Constantinople and Eusebius of, uh, on the ground that they thought the word had been made flesh and not just assumed flesh from the Virgin, and that Christ had two natures when Flavian and Hilary objected. This course called for a pro monophysite mob to enter the church, which assaulted Flavian as he clung to the altar. Flavian, Flavian died three days later. I don't know. I didn't know that. This course then placed Eusebius of Theolorum under arrest and demanded um, assembled bishops approve his actions. Fearing the mob, they all did. The papal legate refused to attend the second session, at which several more Orthodox bishops were depressed, deposed, including Ibas of uh, Edessa, Irenaeus of Tyre, Dumas of Antioch, Theodoret, Dioscorus, then had Cyril of Alexandria's 12 anathemas declared Orthodox with the intent. So this is all in the Ephesus, uh, in the Council of Ephesus. Um, let's go. The situation continued to deteriorate with Leo demanding the convocation of a new council and Emperor Theodosius refusing to budge, all the while appointing bishops in agreement with this course. All this changed dramatically with the Emperor's death and the elevation of Martian to the imperial throne. To resolve the simmering tension, Martian announced his intention to hold a new council to set aside the council. He, he wanted to cancel that council of Ephesus. The, uh, they called it the Latrocinium, or Robbers' Council, by Pope Leo. Uh, so uh, the sister of Theodosius, the, the queen, may have influenced his, this decision or even made the convention of a council a requirement during her negotiation with... Um, she wanted to marry the king, the new king. Leo had pressed for it to take place in Italy, but Emperor Martian instead called for it to convene at Chalcedon, who was closer to Constantinople, and would thus allow him to respond quickly to any event along the Danube. The council opened in October 8, 451. Martian had the bishops deposed by the scores returned to their diocese and had the body of Flavian brought to the capital to be buried honorably. The emperor asked Leo 
to preside over the council, but Leo again chose to send legates in his place. This time, bishops uh, Bascasinos of Libyam and Julian of Kos and two priests, Boniface and Basil, represented the Western Church at the council. The council was attended by about 520 bishops or their representatives and was the largest and best documented of the first seven ecumenical councils. Seven is the number that the Eastern Orthodox keep uh, keep as the seven ecumenical council. When we talk about Eastern Orthodox, we're talking about the Greek, uh, the Russian, the uh, East Europe, or you can say Serbian, uh, Czechoslovakian, um, uh, uh, Romanian, not Armenian, Romanian. <clears throat> All the sessions were held in the Church of St. Euphemia, martyr outside the city and directly op opposite Constantinople. As to the number of sessions held by the Council of Chalcedon, there is a great dis discrepancy in the various texts of the Acts. So, um, Someone had refused to give Dioscorus, who has excommunicated Leo already, leading up to the council. He, before he went into the council, Dioscorus excommunicated Pope, the great Leo of Rome. Uh, so they uh, refused to give him a seat at the council. As a result, he was moved to the nave of the church. Bas Cassinus further ordered re reinstatement of Theodoret and that he be given a seat. But this move caused such an uproar among the council father that Theodoritz also sat in the name. Though he was given a vote in the proceedings, which began with the trial of this course. Martian wished to bring proceedings to speedy end and asked the council to make a pronouncement on the doctrine of the incarnation before continuing the trial. The council fathers, however, felt that no new creed was necessary and that the doctrine had been laid out clearly in Leo's tomb. They were, they were also hesitant to write a new creed as the first council of Ephesus had forbidden the composition or use of any new creed. Atias, deacon of Constantinople, then read Cyril's letter to Nestorius and a, a second letter to John of Antioch. The bishops responded, we all so believe. Pope Leo thus believes, we all thus believe. As Cyril so believed, Cyril is the Patriarch of Alexandria in the Council of Ephesus, the first one. As Cyril so believe, we all of us, um, eternal be the memory of Cyril. As the epistle of Cyril teach us is our mind, such has been our faith, such is our faith. This is the mind of the Archbishop Leo, so he believes, so he will, he has written. Um, the clerk of the consistory then read from a book handed to him by Aetius, the synodical letter of Leo to Flavian. That's Leo's tomb. After the reading of the letter, the bishops cried out, this is the faith of the fathers, this is the faith of apostles. apostles. So we all believe, thus the Orthodox believe. Peter has spoken thus through Leo, etc. The same thing. However, during the readings of Leo's tomb, three passages were challenged as being potentially an historian. And here we have a problem. Their orthodoxy was defended by using the writings of Cyril. Due to such concerns, the council decided to adjourn and appoint a special committee to investigate the orthodoxy of Leo's tomb. Judging it by the standard of Cyril, 12 chapters. They have, he has 12 anathemas of people, uh, wrong teachings he would, would excommunicate. As some of the bishops present raised, present raised concern about their compatibility. This committee was headed by Anatolius, Patriarch of Constantinople, and was given five days to carefully study the matter. The committee un unanimously decided in favor of the orthodoxy of Leo, determining that what he said was compatible with the teaching of Cyril. A number of other bishops also entered statements to the effect that they believed that Leo's tomb was not in contradiction with the teaching of Cyril as well. The council continued the discourse trial, but he refused to appear before the assembly. However, a historical account from the Eastern Orthodox Church note that the discourse was put under solitary arrest. As a result, he was condemned, but by an underwhelming uh, amount, more than half bishop present in the previous sessions, did not attend his condemnation. So most of the people, or more than half of them, they did not attend that. And all of his decrees were declared null. Empress Polcheria 
that's the, now she's the wife of the emperor, told this chorus in my father's time, there was a man who was stubborn, referring to St. John Chrysostom, and you are aware of what was made to him. That's very wrong, very bad. So uh, there was a, the, the, in the time of John Chrysostom, the queen, he challenged her because um, she was doing stuff that's not really appropriate at all. And she exiled him and, and had forced him to walk or do like a very tough journey. And he died in the journey. When she said, when this empress told that his course, uh, responded, and you may recall that your mother prayed at his tomb as she was bleeding of sickness. Pulcheria is said to have slapped his course in the face, breaking some of his teeth, and ordered the guards to confine him, which they did pulling his beard hair. His course is said to have put these in a box, and send him back to his church in Alexandria, noting this is the fruit of my faith. Martian responded by exiling this course. All of the bishops were then asked to sign their assent to the tomb, but a group of 13 Egyptians refused, saying that they would assent to the traditional faith. As a result, the emperor's commissioners decided that a credo would indeed be necessary and presented the text to the fathers. No consensus was reached to, the, to make a new creed. Uh, Basquinius or uh, Bascasinus added to the credo, the bishops would have to relocate. The committee then sat in oratory, the most holy martyr Euphemia, and afterwards reported the definition of faith, which uh, teaching the same doctrine was not the tomb of Leo. Uh, it, although it could be reconciled with Cyril's formula of reunion, reunion, it was not compatible in its wording with Cyril's 12 anathemas. In particular, the third anathema reads, that's the third of Cyril. If anyone divides the one Christ, the hypostasis after the union, joining them only by a conjunction of dignity or authority or power, and, or, and not rather by a coming together in the union by nature, let him be anathema. So he's saying in the, the, so that the, the union is apparent, is not just, it's not real. There's no real union like the fire and the iron. Um, this appeared to some, okay, sorry, where are we? Uh, as their criteria unanimous, unanimously determined to be orthodox and the Council of Three Exceptions supported this. Uh, so, Okay, results. This is what we are going to um, end up with here. The Council of Chalcedon issued the Chalcedonian definition, which repudiated the notion of a single nature in Christ. They, they negated that. They didn't want to have that. And they declared that he has two natures in one person and hypostases. It also insisted on the com completeness of his two natures, Godhead and manhood. The council also issued 27 disciplinary canons governing church administration authority. In a further decree, later known as Canon 28, the bishops declared that the see of Constantinople had the patriarchal status with equal privileges to the see of Rome. No reference was made in Canon 28 to the Bishop of Rome or Constantinople having their authority from being successors to Peter or Andrew, respectively. Instead, the stated reasons in the actual text of the canon that the episcopacy of these cities had been granted their status was the importance of the cities, because they were the capitals. Consequently, Pope Leo declared canon 28 null and void. Here we go. So Leo didn't like it because it will put him under or equal to Chalcedon, and he did not like that. He didn't like it. So you understand in this time, the whole issue is not actually really looking into the nature of Christ or words about the nature of Christ. It was mostly a power struggle, unfortunately, a power struggle. And Rome is keen, very keen on keeping the dominion over the Christian world from the beginning. So what I want to say from this is um, what we understand. So you have two, you have two, um, two problems. The problem here is Nestorius saying that Jesus is 
two persons in union. And you have a problem here that Jesus is one person of one nature. So the church that the churches that supported Chalcedon were trying, if we take it on the face value, trying very hard to stay away from um, that one nature. So they will be opposing to anything that stresses the one. Yeah. The churches that supported the the or or contradicted Chalcedon was the churches that was afraid to have the Nestorian idea of two. So anything that stresses the two will be a problem for them. So um, uh, there, this this had been a problem since Cyril, since Cyril started the fight against that idea of Nestorianism, and the the Christian world started to divide. So after Chalcedon and the exile, the exile of the Skoros, you have these two groups the Chalcedonian group and the Oriental Orthodox churches. And the main three churches are Syriac, Coptic, Armenian. Um, this is the first beginning, the beginning of the division of the Apostolic Church. So this, the beginning of the church breaking down. That's it. So here, you, you, this is where the Coptic, this is us in, in red. We stop here, our history that does not change from here onward. That's the same. The Chalcedonian church is not, doesn't stop because Rome of, of Rome insistence on the, the dominance of the Christian world. You get another one, a break again. Chalcedon and Rome who is always going to fight for who has, at least Chalcedon didn't say we wanna be the preeminent. Um, the Rome said we have to be the preeminent church. We have to be the the supreme, the father of all the churches. So Chalcedon at one point, we'll do, we're going to talk about this next time. Uh, this is uh, Pope Leo the Ninth. Uh, we're going to talk about that in 1054. Chalcedon is 541. 1054 is uh, the great, they call it the great schism, and we're going to say why it's called the great schism. You might say this is the, the lesser schism or the little schism because the, the amount of Christians that was actually uh, kicked out of the of the union are not as big as this one. So we're going to talk about this next time. Okay. Any questions, any thoughts about this? If you have any questions, it would be great. Well, at least if we can think about them until we meet next week. I wanted also to do something. So uh, this is one side, this is the history part of it, but the other sides of the church, which is uh, the church traditions and the church uh, way to see, this is what we want to go. But I will build on the skeleton of the history. At least you understand where things are. Every We, we want to go and, and, and just you know find out where are the other denominations come from. Like you have uh, after that, in the Middle Ages, in the 16th century, 17th century, started the breaking down of the other denominations from the Catholic Church. You get you get all these denominations: Presbyterian, Congregational, the Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, Anglican, and the uh, the Episcopalian, um, the Reformed Church, the Anabaptist, the Lutheranism, Mennonites, and then and then very soon, very recently, that's going to be in the if we have another page, it would be the non-denominational, which is like the one of the recent arrivals. Okay, that's that's it for today. Please bring your questions. If you had a chance, look at the book of Saint Athanasius. That would be. So I'm not going to ask you to read too many things, but uh, keep in mind we need to uh, memorize the creed if possible, the creed, and. Um, and if we can get uh, like a, a quick reading and take pieces from the incarnation of the word by uh, St. Athanasius of Alexandria. Okay, let's say our Father, and then in the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. 
And thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. And so we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Now and forever. May the love of God the Father and grace is only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of God is with you. Peace be with you.